morning, everybody. I'm Reverend Francesca Fortunato. My pronouns are she and her. I am an interfaith minister and also a member of this community, so I'm really happy to be here in the pulpit with you all today. So, I was sitting at a table in Fort Washington Public House with my longtime friend Eric Vetter. Eric is a native New Yorker, and he knew that I was too. But he wanted more specifics, so he asked me, exactly where in the city were you born? I looked out the window at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital and said, right across the street. Then, because Eric is blind and couldn't see where I was looking, Columbia Presbyterian, 165th and Broadway, literally right across the street from where we're sitting. Isn't that cool? He agreed that it was, and it is. It is cool. I am so lucky. My wife Lynn has a friend who likes to say, there are New Yorkers all over the world. The lucky ones get to live here. Lynn's friend wasn't born in New York City, but has lived here for many years. And she was a New Yorker at heart for a long time before she made this city her home. That was lucky for her. I'm happy for her. But when I remember to count my blessings, I'm even happier for myself. I get to keep walking on the sidewalks where I literally took my first steps. Another friend of mine, Reverend Galina Kraskova, is, in addition to being an interfaith minister as I am, a priest of Asatru, Norse pagan polytheism. And in her religion, there's a particular type of animism about places. It's a belief that places have personae, consciousness, souls. Although I don't believe that in the particular way that Galena does, meaning that I don't sense that personal presence everywhere I go, I do have a feeling about New York City being, for lack of a better word right this minute, ensouled. She is one of my mothers. She speaks to me. She's in my blood my heartbeats, and the rhythm of my feet on her sidewalks. I want to tell you some stories that I hope will make you understand some of the things that make this city more than just a place, and even more than just a home for me. I want to tell them so that I can offer them as gifts to you, in hope that you can find your own mystical, magical, glorious inspiration and spiritual wow factors here regardless of whether you were born here, came here decades ago, came here yesterday, or even, in the case of some participating on Zoom, have never been here at all. Because even if you're in another city, town, state, country, or continent, you can still be a New Yorker at heart, at soul. And I want that for you. It is just the best magic. So here goes. One of the more recent stories is something that happened literally right across the street from here. My wife and I had ridden the subway from our apartment in Inwood in Upper Manhattan to 72nd Street in order to attend the Pride Sunday concert presented by the 4th U Choir. We were early, so we decided to sit on one of the benches on Central Park West for a few minutes before going in. I had some bread in my bag because we'd had dinner at a diner before the concert, and when bread comes with a restaurant meal, since I'm gluten intolerant and can't eat it myself, I save it for the birds. So, a bird comes hopping along, a sparrow. I take out a piece of my bread, break it into crumbs, and scatter some onto the sidewalk. The sparrow hops over, takes a big crumb into her mouth, and then an even tinier sparrow comes hopping toward her, opens its mouth wide and starts cheeping urgently. It was her baby. Instead of eating the bread herself, Mama Sparrow leans over and puts it into her baby's mouth. Lynn and I were almost in tears watching. I thought I was feeding a bird, which was great, but helping that bird feed her baby? Neither of us had ever seen a baby sparrow before. So tiny, so helpless. And we had helped, but wait, it gets better. Along comes a human mother with a human child. The child appears to be maybe five or six years old. 
They have seen me giving bread to the sparrow mother and seen the baby eat. Like me and Lynn, they're delighted and fascinated. So I gesture toward the child and offer her some of my bread so that she can feed the birds too. She thanks me and starts tossing more breadcrumbs onto the sidewalk. And my heart is so overflowing with love for all of the little birds and little humans and adult birds and humans who are in it together here with me and my wife and the whole awesome universe that I don't know what to do with myself and my happily breaking heart. So <laughs> I do what I'd planned to do. I cross the street with Lynn, enter forth you, and enjoy the wonderful concert. But as I enter the building, I'm wearing some mama bird wings of my own that nobody else can see. Now, before I tell you another inspiring story about life in New York City, I do have to acknowledge an elephant in the room. It's not all sweet little birdies here, right? This city can be dangerous. That's true. As with any po densely populated city, there's more violence and crime here than in places with fewer people, less poverty, more open space. And recently I was called for jury duty and the case in question was one in which the defendant was accused of robbing people at knife point. When the judge asked whether any of the prospective jurors had been victims of a similar crime, I raised my hand, and so did about half a dozen others among the 50 of us in the courtroom. That wouldn't happen in Bugsplat. Crime happens everywhere, of course, but it's more likely to happen statistically in a big city like this one. And I am hypervigilant. I never ride subways alone late at night. I have my keys in my hand ready to use as weapons when walking on the more deserted streets, especially after dark. So yes, my beloved hometown can be dangerous, but I don't love her any less for that. In fact, the perils of this place can actually create a greater sense of solidarity with our neighbors. We know that we need to look after each other. We need to care about strangers because we need those strangers to care about us. Which leads to the next story that I want to share with you. It was early evening, a couple of weeks ago. Lynn and I looked at our Fitbits, which we wear and use rather obsessively. I've probably got 5,000 something steps so far today. And decided to up our step count by walking in Inwood Hill Park. We had just entered the park when we heard sirens. First, a police car drove into the park, followed by an ambulance, followed by a fire truck. What the heck were all these emergency vehicles doing in the park? A bit nervous, but also curious, Lynn and I followed the vehicles until they stopped on one of the paved paths near the fences that surround the East River at that end. Out in the middle of the water, there was a person on a jet ski that had gotten stuck on a sandbar. The person was stranded on the sandbar with no way to get back to shore. Somebody must have called 911, and the assembled emergency responders were trying to figure out how to rescue the person. Meanwhile, Lynn and I were not the only people watching the rescue efforts. Lots of other people had gathered around the fences. People who had been walking their dogs stopped to watch, Parents with little ones in strollers stopped to watch. Teenagers with illegal beers stopped to watch. And the thing about all of us watchers was that we weren't just gawking out of curiosity. There was a sense that everyone in the park was waiting with breath held, praying, hoping so hard that the stranded person would be saved soon. It took a while. A police department boat tried to get close but the sandbar was too big to allow that to happen without getting the boat stuck, too. A red boat from the fire department approached from another direction, also without success. Finally, a police helicopter started circling directly above the sandbar. At first, we thought that they were going to airlift the person, but what they were actually doing was using the air pressure created to stir up the water and partially submerge the sandbar so that it would be possible for one of the boats to approach. Finally, the fire department boat got close, and we saw the person stand up from the jet ski, walking up to the edge of the sandbar. Then a person got out of the boat with a flotation device, 
and paddled toward the sandbar, strapped some ropes around the jet ski, and got onto it with its rider so that the two of them could be towed toward the fire department boat. When the jet ski person was lifted onto the boat, all of us clapped and cheered. It was an awesome moment of unity and union. Strangers passionately engaged in caring for the well-being of someone that none of us knew. Just humans being human together in the particularly mystical way that mundane urban life makes manifest. Lynn and I realized that we had totally forgotten to check our Fitbits. We were reminded that some things were a lot more important than our personal fitness goals. Sometimes the city brings strangers together, not merely in shared concern, but in shared action. I was waiting on the one train platform at 215th Street when I saw a woman and a little girl looking down at the floor next to the trash can while saying, aw, and poor little thing. I walked over to see what they were looking at and saw a very small bird. Yes, another baby bird story. Crouched behind the trash can. Is it hurt? I asked. Before they could say anything, the station agent walked onto the platform and told us, that's one of the baby pigeons. They have a nest in the rafters, and the babies sometimes fall out. We can get it back into the nest. The station agent then got a plastic bucket and held it up against the trash can on one side. Then he said, if you stand around on the other sides, the bird won't be able to go anywhere except inside the bucket. So the mother, little girl, and I surrounded the trash can while the station agent held the bucket in place. The little bird hesitated, but after a minute or so, hopped into the bucket. The station agent was then able to pick up the bucket, tip it into the nest in the rafters, and get the baby bird back home. You've heard the expression, teamwork makes the dream work? I never would have dreamed when I set off for the train station that morning that I would be joining a team with two other passengers and a station agent working to get a baby pigeon back into its nest. But I couldn't have dreamed of a better way to start my day. And I got the impression that the little girl member of our team was especially proud of herself. She will probably never forget the day she got to rescue a baby bird. Now the fact that I have not one but two baby bird stories also points toward another point that I want to make today about spiritual inspiration in the city. The stereotype about peak spiritual experiences and epiphanies is that they're most likely to happen in nature. Meditating by the ocean or at the top of a mountain, that's the thing that's supposed to get us closest to a sense of union with the universe, God, goddess, the divine, wow. The mountaintop experience is almost a cliche, but nature is everywhere. Wildlife is everywhere. So how about a subway platform experience? a park bench experience, a street corner experience. My friend Allison, who went to a Christian science Sunday school as a child, was taught by her Sunday school teacher. There is no spot where God is not. There's profound truth in that. The divine, by whatever name you choose to use, would not be truly divine if its presence was limited only to those places that we designate as nature spots. So what I'm hoping you'll take away from these stories is a sense of mystery and wonder that it can accompany you on your urban journeys in New York City and other cities you may visit. Be ready for the soul of the city to touch your soul, uniting you with all of the wildlife, human life, and magical possibilities that await an open mind and a loving heart. Look up and see the green man and goddess carvings adorning the old buildings. Look into the noble, elegant faces of those two main branch library lions called patience and fortitude. Look down and see the sparkle of mica mixed with the tar of the sidewalks. Look at the faces of your fellow humans and be awed at the awesome, amazing array of beauty to be found within a single subway car. Those of you who are here in person will walk out the door of this building in just a short while. And many of those on Zoom are also in New York or in other large cities and will also be stepping outside soon. I hope that when you do, 
you'll be ready to receive the spiritual gifts and blessings that the city offers to all of us in such great abundance. The soul of the city is the soul of divine love expressed in the vast diversity of life and creation to be found here. You don't have to buy it or earn it. Just let her share it with you and receive it with joy. Amen and blessed be. Thank you.